This video is on why the Long Night prequel is an inherently bad idea for Game of Thrones. Originally, I made one huge, over three hours long documentary, and then I cut it up into smaller pieces and posted them individually based on their internal chapters, because there's four main points. Then, when I actually got to point four on settings overall, cultural aspects and locations that physically don't exist, it ran so long that I decided to split that up yet again. So... Now there's point 4A, which I already posted, and what you're watching now is point 4B. 4A was on cultural stuff, this is on locations. And cultural things like, was their conception of kingship even the same, or was it more of a ringleader first among equals? We know nothing about their social structure. That, For starters, the faith of the seven doesn't exist, so they don't have knights or things like that. Uh, did they even have the Raven Network? We don't know. And also, what were their societal patterns towards uh, the role of women? Were women allowed to inherit political power? Were there female warriors or not? Did they have a stigma against homosexuality or not? Because that's really more of a Faith of the Seven thing. So just open questions, because it's such a blank slate with no world-building They'd have to, and Martin has said, they, they have to invent everything because I described so little about it, which is an inherent problem. Uh, before I go into locations now, two quick points I forgot to mention in the first part. Uh, thraldom. That in the present day, the Ironborn practice thraldom, that if you take prisoners in raids, you can force them to work for you as thralls, uh, working the mines, working the fields in the Iron Islands. But they do make a key distinction that thralls are not slaves. This is not the same thing as slavery. It skirts the line a bit, but they go, you're only allowed to keep thralls that you personally captured, or your forces captured, that it is forbidden to buy or sell thralls. They are legally not considered property. They have certain rights of personhood and property ownership themselves, freedom to marry. That thralls are more like prisoners of war. Or like you know, super serfdom that you know they have. This is a peasant society. It isn't exactly a free society that you have peasants throughout the rest of Westeros who are forced to work for their lords that don't have a lot of rights. That the Ironborn just go, you can capture peasants from other people and make them work for you. So it's not quite the same as the others. So it is explicitly not slavery in the books. The priests get annoyed, get really angry when they hear that people were being sold into slavery. They went, no, that's not thraldom. We don't do slavery. Well, in the World of Ice and Fire sourcebook, it did explain that we know reliably from a lot of historical sources, you know, it's oral tradition, but we know from so many legends mention it, that the original first men in the Age of Heroes and the Long Night, all of them used to practice thraldom. This was a common practice throughout Westeros in the Age of Heroes. And that's actually one of the... They don't even need to prove that. They 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 actually cite that as proof of the theory that the Ironborn are an offshoot of the First Men, that they're one of the original First Men tribes that managed to cross over the ocean to the Iron Islands on ships from the mainland and then culturally diverged while they were there. But they were a branch of the First Men. And they we're pretty sure of that because, you know, like they have king's moots and stuff. And also, you know, we have so many legends that the original first men practiced thraldom. How did thraldom end? We're not really sure. It seems that it just faded over time, that people gradually stopped doing it. Interesting question if it stopped more because the faith of the seven was opposed to it on the mainland. And well, the North stayed independent, and I guess they just stopped doing it from cultural association. It fell out of favor, but maybe it fell out of favor long before the Andals came. We're not sure. But if you were hypothetically making a show set during the Long Night or the Age of Heroes, you would see thraldom more often. So if they introduce a character going, oh, House Stark rose from nothing, originally Bran the Builder, their founder, was a lowly thrall, captured and in service to House Dustin of the Barrow Kings, but eventually broke free and amassed his own followers and became a lord. Sort of like Bevenberg in um, 
in The Last Kingdom, where he was a thrall of the Vikings. But the point is, you could say that if they introduce, oh, there's this character who's a lowly thrall, yes, we know, they practiced thraldom. That, that was a thing in that era. The other, there were two things, the other minor thing was human sacrifice. Uh, we're not sure how extensive that was, but they start saying, well, there's legends that there was human sacrifice, and we objectively know there was, because in the books, in one of Bran's visions, he sees uh, someone being sacrificed before a weirwood tree, ritualistically. Exactly why were they conducting human sacrifices, we're not sure. It doesn't seem like it was a habitual thing. I think it's Something they did to really punish their enemies if they captured them alive. You know, just it was a torture thing. Of uh, There's another point where they're talking about the wolf's den in White Harbor, where they go, when we finally caught the pirates who had occupied the fort, uh, we butchered all of them and uh, before the heart tree and hung their entrails from it as an offering to the old gods. Because they were pirates, you know, they were punishing them. So I don't think it was a regular thing, but they were known to do that to their enemies. Not unlike, again, uh, the Vikings show, where they mention we're going to cut the blood eagle, we're going to rip someone's lungs out and watch them die slowly because they're still connected. Cutting the blood eagle was a real thing, so fine. But it wasn't like they needed to do it. It wasn't a culture of human sacrifice. It's, we are doing this to really mess with you. Like how burning a witch in medieval, well, Reformation-era Europe could be considered a blood sacrifice, I guess, of we're murdering someone in the name of our faith. But So, if they put in something like that, I wouldn't say it's an utterly invented idea. There's stories about we did human sacrifice to our enemies, and we had a social pattern of thraldom, which gradually evolved into peasantry. Those are cultural things, but that's holdover stuff from part one, that part 4A. Now I'm going on to point 4B, which I'm re-recording because I split it off and I want it to be shorter to get it to flow, that this is objectively in black and white talking about, okay, what locations are there that we could see? And fundamentally... Many locations in Westeros, you know, just castles and cities, simply did not exist during the Age of Heroes. Tying into the reason I gave in the list that if this is supposed to be a nostalgia hook, that the entire point of why would you pick Long Night over a more established idea, more based on Martin's writings or outlines he gave, at least from the world book, this is the least material of any idea, is, well, because the TV audience would be excited about the White Walkers. It's the only other one with White Walkers in it. Other than White Walkers, there is nothing in it. There aren't characters, there aren't narratives, and even most of the places that you see, I mean, mentally picture in your mind's eye, try to list off mentally as I'm going through this, where did you physically see... TV scenes taking place, dialogue. Most of those locations don't exist, so it's, oh, we're ready to go back to Westeros when there's nothing there. And it's not that you know, other ideas are, oh, what if we have a show set on the other continents? Martin has said one of the ideas is set beyond Westeros. Would you like to see new and exciting places versus old familiar places like with a, the Dance of the Dragons would have a lot of familiar places like King's Landing again. This isn't a case of old locations or new locations. There's nothing in Westeros at this time period. It's barely settled. Most of Westeros was still just primeval forest at the time of the Long Night. We're talking Bronze Age Britain. You know, Celts and Druids, there weren't these giant cities there. Perspective. 8,000 years ago, during the Age of Heroes, King's Landing was just three bare hills in an empty field at the mouth of the Blackwater River. The entire city was only built 300 years ago, so, so when you're seeing all these wonderful wish lists of, Hooray, long night, we're going to see Westeros again, and you don't see them putting a shred of thought into this, like the first thing you'd bring up is, wait a minute, King's Landing isn't in it. That's a major location. That you see sound bites, but not people really thinking out what would be in this, physically. 
I mean, a few years ago, I saw someone compile an analysis that something like a third to a half of scenes in the TV series have been set in King's Landing. Not so much in the later seasons, but particularly weighted towards the front end of it, due to all the politics, you know, and disproportionately more than the books due to invented or condensed scenes. And I don't have a problem with that. That's what I would do. I'd be arguing you don't need to make a set for all of these things. Make a conversation that happened in Castle Stokeworth happen in the small council. This is fine. We know you need to condense that. But it's a bigger blow. Imagine mentally where scenes were taking place. The small council chamber, all of those big discussion scenes, that isn't there. The Iron Throne in the throne room, that isn't there. Or just in, in the Red Keep's uh, private chambers, none of that is there. Whereas Dance of the Dragons would use this very extensively, and Targaryen Conquest would start without King's Landing, but it's the story of the founding of King's Landing. And as opposed to, oh, the Long Night, you'll see the wall by the end of it. You would see early King's Landing by the end of the first season of a Targaryen Conquest show. I mean, it would be a uh, mud and wood fort, you know, the Aegon Fort, when it's just a stockade, but you could point to it and say, this is the beginning of King's Landing to the audience. So, going into the locations now, just the rest of this is going down the list. I want to go over objectively, and please, do not feel afraid to react to each of these in the comments, specifically. I want to spur discussion. Because I don't think any news site I've seen is really going over this thoroughly. So, here are major recurring locations in the TV series that existed in the Age of Heroes. It's important because it's things that would be recognizable to a TV-only audience that didn't read the books or watch the animated featurettes. Those aren't really anything to them. That Most people don't watch those, the overwhelming majority. That what did they see on screen that would be familiar to them that makes this logical as a hook to them? As for what are my criteria, well, this largely overlaps with locations that were featured in the title sequence. And, you know, here's the article. We have an article on Game of Thrones Wiki on the title sequence, which that's a budget and time limit thing that they said we only have time to show about six things in the opening credits, and we always show King's Landing in the wall. So there's one or two places that didn't justify making it. Like, they never made a little in intro animatic for Volantis, because they said, well, we only visited it twice, we didn't know if we'd even go back a second time, and it wasn't worth making. So I'm supplementing this with a few other things which I... On the wiki, I put in the navigation menus. Like, I am going to mention Volantis in this, even though it never was in the title sequence, but I think most of this is pretty logical. You know, tell me if there's a location I left out that you feel a TV audience is really tied to. I think this covers everything. You follow, you know, the title sequence and then one or two other things that are obvious, like Volantis. So, I'm going to go through this region by region, first in Westeros, and then lands beyond Westeros. Starting with the Crown Lands. King's Landing physically doesn't exist during the Long Night. It was built by the Targaryens who only conquered Westeros 300 years ago. Dragonstone physically does not exist. The castle. It was only built around 500 years ago by the Valyrians early Targaryens. And Dragonstone was a major location for TV-only viewers since the beginning of Season 2 as Stannis' headquarters. And particularly in Season 7, major focus was put on it as Daenerys reclaimed her ancestral castle. And they had all these additions that weren't in Season 2, this major new throne room set built, carved out of the rock, which is great, and money well spent. This is what I would do, that many prequels would need to use Dragonstone as a location. Uh, the Targaryen Conquest, the Dance of the Dragons, uh, the rumored Valyria prequel said Dragonstone would be in it. So this is a location that the other three out of four prequel pitches would want to use, so it makes sense that they would invest money into a set they want to reuse. 
Next region, the Riverlands. River Run physically does not exist. The seat of House Tully, the castle was only built after the Andal invasion 6,000 years ago. They weren't Andals, but the Andal lord gave them money to build a castle and serve them as bannermen, so, but they state that it wasn't around during the Age of Heroes, which that ha the Andal invasions came 2,000 years after the Long Night. The Long Night and the Age of Heroes aren't synonymous, so we know River Run would definitely not be in it. And we saw more exteriors of that in Season 6, but you know, like, we saw it physically for the first time in Season 3 when Rob was there having scenes with the Karstarks and everything, so that's not in it. Also in the Riverlands, the Twins physically does not exist. Uh, major location since Season 1, and House Frey was only founded and built the castle 600 years ago. This wouldn't be in the Long Night 8,000 years ago. Also in the Riverlands, Harren Hall physically does not exist. Think of how much time Arya spent there in Season 2 and recurring after that. It was only finished by the time of the Targaryen Conquest itself, 300 years ago, finished just as they were showing up. And construction began three generations before that, but that's nothing. This was empty field, there was nothing there. And, you know, we saw a lot of Harrenhal he changed hands often in the War of the Five Kings. It, in the books, I think it's the Lannisters captured it twice, and the Starks captured it twice, and then they got it back again. It, it's in the middle of the middle of the continent, so it changed hands constantly. I just had this mental image of, what news today? Uh, well, sire, Harrenhal has fallen. Well, that isn't news. It, it's, 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 oh, yeah, you captured Harrenhal. Big deal. Um... Also in the Riverlands, and this is why I meant that it's not in the opening credits, but I put this in nav menus because scenes happen here frequently enough. Uh, the Inn at the Crossroads. There's been a reasonable number of scenes set there from seasons one through seven, actually. The Inn at the Crossroads physically does not exist. It was only built during the reign of King Jaehaerys I Targaryen over 200 years ago. And a lot more scenes actually happen there due to condensing scenes that were in other inns in the books. Hot Pie goes to a separate inn in the books, which is fine. That's what I would do. And this brings up a related issue. None of the major highways of Westeros existed, like the King's Road. They were built by Jaehaerys I as part of his public works projects. So travel was drastically slower. This is an issue like a Targaryen Conquest series would have to deal with the fact that, you know, I think they'd make a combined Targaryen Conquest plus Faith Militant Uprising show with, like, Visenya as a main character throughout because she lives through it. And pointing out, like, when Maegor is having wars, armies can't move that fast because they don't have the highways yet. This is before they were built. Of course, the TV show doesn't really care about travel times anymore, and it doesn't make sense even to casual viewers. Just... In the words of Ian Malcolm, God damn it, I hate being right all the time, that people are laughing off, oh, you book fans complaining that Littlefinger is moving around too fast in season two. Well, where are you now? After season seven, where dragons are zipping to the wall and ravens are going down in a single day and enough time to react to that. And they're even, god damn it, showing maps on screen so even casual viewers know this is half a continent that they just stopped caring. This isn't, well, no, you need to change things for an adaptation. It got just plain sloppy. They don't even think about it anymore, and they're surrounded by yes-men. Trying to think of a world in which we have sane people running things as the norm, however, with other showrunners that, okay, how would people get around without these major highways? Though, maybe a long night show would n not show us anything outside of the North, for all we know. Maybe they wouldn't need to go down to uh, the Stormlands really fast or something. But that's an issue. They don't have any highways. Speaking of which, the Stormlands. Storm's End may exist at the beginning of a long night prequel. It was rumored to have been constructed during the Age of Heroes. 
It is the strongest castle in all of Westeros, arguably. I think it's up there with maybe Dragonstone, but pretty much it's the strongest one in all of Westeros. It's never fallen to external siege. But, and this is the issue I was introducing before, it never appeared in the TV series on screen. There were budget constraints in Season 2, so they just had Stannis confront Renly by the coast in a field. And fine, I know there's budget cuts, it's probably what I would have done, you don't need to show the castle to have the characters talking, but really think about this, if the whole point, selling point of Long Night is casual TV viewers who don't realize there's no story to it will be hooked by, oh my god, White Walkers. Those same TV-only fans have no strong investment in this location. They have mentioned it by name in dialogue a couple of times. You know, Stannis has talked about it, Cersei's talked about it with Olena. But if this didn't appear on screen, it doesn't really count. It's things they were familiar with, and they're not familiar with Storm's End. Then on to Dorne. The Water Gardens and Sunspear. Neither one of them physically exists. It just they, they just call it Dorn in the title sequence, because uh, did they not want us to know they weren't even bothering to show Sunspear? I'm not sure. But TV Dorn was a humiliating failure, and they will be held accountable for it. It's not something that randomly happened. It was their fault. But it, it wouldn't be a draw to viewers, even if it did exist, that Sunspear, their actual castle seat, got built up by the Roynar refugees with House Martell when they migrated there a thousand years ago. The Water Gardens are barely a century old, so those wouldn't be there. Moving along, we get to the Vale and the Eyrie, the mountaintop castle seat of House Arryn. Physically does not exist. The Arryns are Andals. They only came and built the Eyrie after the Andal invasion. 2,000 years after the Long Night, after the end of the Age of Heroes. Th there was nothing there. And that's been a reasonably important location since Season 1. It appeared very prominently in Season 1. That, oh, we don't need to see Sansa in the Vale again. Well, I wanted to see that, but th that does not exist. Also in the Vale, and this wasn't in the opening credits, but I, the, even this is a stretch, what about the Bloody Gate? The, it's this natural choke point in the mountain passes that it, you would want to defend this with fortifications that no enemy army has ever broken through. It never appeared in the opening title sequence, and it really only appeared in Season 4 at all, briefly, and was just depicted as a road with a gatehouse. It's actually a whole fort unto itself for when they, for, uh, when they have to lodge there in winter because the snow is in the area are just too much. The, the Bloody Gate wouldn't be a big draw. It technically existed, but was just a rough-hewn, unmortared wall after the fashion of the ring forts of the First Men. So, if you did go through there, you could point out, oh, we're going through the show point of the Bloody Gate, but this wouldn't be, this isn't a setting like King's Landing. People wouldn't be attracted to this. It's probably not what it is now, and we barely saw it in, in the TV show, so I'm pretty sure this doesn't count. That's grasping at straws. Then we get to, I love the memes for this after Season 7, the letdown it was, High Garden and Casterly Rock. What I expected versus what I got, I found this on Reddit, just, you didn't even need to make Casterly Rock and High Garden as fully realized sets. I mean, look at this, like, the High Garden, it's a matte painting. It's not limited by anything other than what your artist can draw. And it doesn't look as good as the drawing that comes in the World of Ice and Fire. It looks smaller. Why? Casterly Rock doesn't look much better either, just the Westerlands. Only part we actually saw that was a named location was Casterly Rock. It was never in the title sequence and only appeared in one episode in Season 7, briefly. And internet memes spread that it looked pretty underwhelming compared to book art or TV descriptions from earlier seasons. 
So would this even be a big draw if it exists? I mean, it, it technically would exist in the age of heroes, but the question is, was this before or after the Long Night? All of these sites conflating, oh, you know, the Long Night will have all these Age of Heroes characters. I talked about this in an earlier video, that we don't know if Lan the Clever lived during the Long Night, or after it, or maybe some time well before it. His story isn't related to it. The bigger issue, I think, is that, well, I think it probably, you could say it existed then, and we wouldn't say you were wrong. The bigger issue is, this isn't a draw for TV viewers. They only saw it briefly in season 7 out of 8. That's nothing. It wasn't this impressive location. There weren't even that many scenes there. Same applies for, now moving on to the Reach, High Garden. Same thing. It really wasn't fleshed out as a location. We only saw it briefly. We're not really sure how much of it would exist at the time. There was probably something there at best that this isn't a draw. While I'm on it here, Horn Hill, also in the Reach, that, yeah, that would probably technically exist, though, again, before or after the Long Night doesn't even matter. And, it, like, the High Garden it would probably just be a ring fort. They do say, you know, the Reach used to be four smaller petty kingdoms around Old Town and High Garden and the Arbor, and Horn Hill was the Eastern Hill Kingdom in the Marches. And, yeah, so the Tarleys would be petty kings ruling over Horn Hill then, presumably. But it isn't a major location, that there's not much there, and is the audience invested in Horn Hill? We saw it once in Season 6, for a lengthy scene, but I don't really think people are attached to that. Now, this is where things start to get interesting. I've been building up to these later ones. In the Reach, you have Old Town, second largest city in Westeros at the time of the War of the Five Kings, which definitely exists. You know, at best, it's just a large town during the Age of Heroes, not necessarily a city yet, but it has existed since as soon as the First Men migrated to that part of Westeros. Possibly since the first generation of the migration waves, that they came from the eastern continent across this land bridge that was later destroyed called the Arm of Dorne, and few of them actually stayed in Dorne because it's a desert, that the general consensus is this must be one of the first places that the First Men actually settled, these nice, relatively open fields, and that Old Town is on a natural harbor. It's a very bountiful location, just naturally. It's an obvious site for a city and major port. But in the TV show, it was only introduced in Season 6, at the very end of it, just in this really nice matte painting, and even in Season 7, we only really saw the Citadel of the Maesters, not the rest of the city. That we didn't see, a casual TV viewer wouldn't know who the High Towers are, the family name. Never saw the sigil officially, in a TV version of it. Or all of the guild halls and other things that are in the city and, in the, and the mother houses. It's just the Citadel, as late as Season 7. So what you're really asking is, did the Order of Maesters exist during the Age of Heroes? And if I had to say yes or no, I would say yes. They originated in Old Town as just a guild of scholars and teachers, and it grew from there naturally, long before the Andals. Before the World of Ice and Fire, we didn't really know where the Maesters came from. Like, were they an Andal thing, or... Were they something the First Men brought with them from the Eastern Continent? No. It started among the First Men who were living in Old Town long before the Andals came. As just a patron funded a guild of scholars, and it grew. I do caution that it existed in some form, though that isn't necessarily a bad thing, that there be proto-maesters around. That They also say that writing and books were only really introduced by the Andals. They only had runes for marking graves before that. The writing, their writing system, making books, that's an Andal thing, not First Men. So written history doesn't go that far back. So maybe the Maesters weren't as formal then. 
Did the Messenger Raven network exist yet? We have no idea. As and we mentally picture them writing messages to each other. Some think that maybe they magically used magical means to communicate with beasts and ravens. I, I'm not sure, but the whole writing network wouldn't be there. But hypothetically, if they showed us this is ancient village where Winterfell would be, and there's some doctor called a maester there who's he's not a jack of all trades scholar. He's just a doctor who says, oh, I'm part of the Doctor's Guild, we call ourselves the Maesters. That would be an idea. That would be an idea, and I'd be fine with that. that well, they weren't quite Maesters yet. I mean, you could play that interesting. If well, We'll see the early stages of the Maesters. You could do that. But again, fundamentally, they act like the Long Night and the Age of Heroes are the same thing when you're mishmashing 4,000 years of history. I generally think the Maesters came into being after the Long Night. I mean, even if they didn't have formal writing as such, there's still a guild, an organization, devoted to passing down knowledge. Even if it was just verbally, as doctors or something, don't you think they'd have better records, better legends of the Long Night as a historical event if the Maesters already existed in some form? And the Maesters don't even believe the Long Night really happened now. They think it was a legend. So even without books, they should have kept some knowledge of the Long Night. It seems more likely that they came after it. I really think all the towns and cities grew up after that because it dialed civilization back to zero from all the devastation. So we didn't really see that much of Old Town. I don't know how much of a draw it would be to TV-only viewers, though... You could try to point them to it, because it was only a little bit in a later season, but let's put that on the list of, yes, these are things we saw. While I'm on the topic of that, there are only five full cities that exist in Westeros at the time of the War of the Five Kings, that they're not as urbanized as the free cities are. The free cities are like medieval Italy and the medieval Italian city-states, and they're like rural Britain. They only have a few cities. So, which of these five cities existed during the Long Night, or at least the Age of Heroes? Well, King's Landing doesn't exist, and Old Town would exist, though it'd probably be smaller. The other three, the point I'm making, that they never appeared in the TV show, so what does it matter? It doesn't count. It's not worth it. But I might as well go over them, that of the three... Lannisport doesn't exist. We know it doesn't exist. That it was founded many generations after Lan the Clever won neighboring Casterly Rock. They said he founded House Lannister, and many generations later, centuries later, some he, the extended family grew so big that a younger branch founded a, a port city next to Casterly Rock to conduct trade with all the gold they had. But even if Land the Clever were to be in a Long Night prequel somehow, and I talk about he really shouldn't be, you would only see Lannisport generations after Land the Clever lived. So if you're doing Long Night and you're somehow forcing Land the Clever into it, you really wouldn't see Lannisport. Or you could have Lannisport but not Land the Clever. I'm going with it probably doesn't exist and it never appeared in the show anyway. It was name dropped a few times. Gulltown was never mentioned by name in TV dialogue. I've been keeping track of this on Game of Thrones Wiki. I think they mentioned it once in one of the animated featurettes about the veil. But not live action. That doesn't count. And the world book says, you know, the Andal invasion began in the veil. This is one of the first places they captured that at the start of the Andal invasion, it wasn't quite a city yet. It was a large and prosperous fishing port. It was a large town. Not quite a city yet. And that's near the end of the Age of Heroes. And as for White Harbor, which is the smallest of these, I'm going in descending order of size from King's Landing, the largest, to White Harbor, the smallest, doesn't exist yet. As a city, it was only founded by House Manderley about a thousand years ago, and before that, in its place was just a small fort called the Wolf's Den to guard against pirates, and I don't think maybe the Wolf's Den wouldn't have even existed that long ago. But there's three other ones that 
never really appeared in the TV show, and they probably would not have existed during the Age of Heroes anyway. The Long Night, certainly. I don't think Gulltown was around during the Long Night. And who's going to argue for, no, we'll see that and fit it in. King's Landing is a huge blow. Of these five, the only one you could kind of say would be in it would be some version of Old Town, which, as a book reader, I'm very attached to because of all the subplots that are there in the books that the TV show glossed over and they didn't condense it, they just threw it out. Moving along, the Iron Islands. We only saw one location in the TV series. Pike Castle on Pike Island. Actually, it exists in some form. You know, they said, well, they've been around there forever. Possibly just a ring fort, or, or maybe we would see an early full castle of it before it fell into pieces in the ocean. That depends on when they built it up. That's an issue of the Andals are the ones that are really famous for building large castles out of stone. So I'm not sure if Pike Castle would have existed before the Andal invasions. The Andals didn't leave a huge imprint on the Iron Islands, but they intermarried with some sellsword groups of Andals. They spread knowledge there in the language. So I'm not sure if that castle would exist before the Andals as a big stone structure that would then crumble. There, there might be some ring fort thing there, but I would argue for that. that yes, if we could plausibly see Pike... And unlike Casterly Rock or High Garden, which are also, well, they're physically there, but the TV audience wouldn't recognize them, this one is a situation where, yes, a lot of significant dialogue scenes happened here, in a location that would be around in the Long Night. It was a major location in Season 2, with the Greyjoy subplot, then disappeared, and didn't prominently reappear again until Season 6 because they didn't plan out how they were going to work the Greyjoy subplot, and I'm happy it was in 6 instead of not being in there at all, when they actually put back in the Kingsmoot subplot, but had major dialogue scenes, very casual viewers would instantly recognize it. Okay, Pike would be there. Finally, we come to the North. Um, Moat Kalen, the strategic gateway to the North, that it's, the, it's guarding the only highway through the swamps for hundreds of miles in either direction that you have to pass through Moat Kalen if you're bringing a land army overland between the north and the rest of Westeros. Otherwise, you'd need ships. And it has existed since the mists of time in the Age of Heroes. I mean, now it's in ruins, but it's still viable. They say that you can tell there were originally 20 towers and all of them have fallen and crumbled into ruin except for three of them, but they're still enough to maintain arrow fire coverage over the causeway and hold it. And the weird thing is, the legends say the Children of the Forest built it in the world of Ice and Fire, that the Children's Green Seers gathered on this spot to conduct the magic ritual that broke the Arm of Dorne, that drowned the neck with the Hammer of the Waters. But while they may have gathered at that location, did they build the castle? That's less clear. The world book explicitly says, we're not really sure who built it or when. And the world book says, it's weird that people think the children would have built it, because they never built in stone. They never built castles. Much less a megastructure on this scale of this complex of 20 forts guarding both sides of the ca of the causeway that they had forest villages and lived in caves. They never built anything like this, so the ruins are massive. So that is probably a, a selling point. You go, we'll see Moat Kalen and how it came to be, but Moat Kalen wasn't as prominent in the TV show. They only really introduced it in season four. They only mentioned it in season two, then in season four, and TV viewers would know what it was, but I think they didn't emphasize well enough this is a strategic choke point. And they didn't explain the part about that there's 20 towers and it used to be this vast, bigger complex and maybe the children built it, maybe they didn't. That part wasn't explained. From the TV show, you would only see, hey, there's this important castle that the Boltons had to take that's guarding the highway. So, but that would be in it. That would be in it. That's an interesting question.
Less of a draw, I think, would be the Dreadfort, that the Dreadfort technically does exist in some form, possibly just as a humble ring fort. That, like, it, it appeared in the show more than Casterly Rock or Highgarden, but not as much as Pike. I don't think people would be as invested in this. It's not too prominent in the TV show. We mostly just saw the dungeons. How many scenes were actually here? But as for it existing, um, it's said in, in the world book that the Boltons and Starks were fighting since the Long Night itself. Which, you know, it's plenty of justification for that. And had the TV show not happened and Martin made a novella prequel, it would have been interesting to see Boltons and Starks fighting in the Long Night. However, after how much they were shilling Ramsay Snow to the point it was exhausted in the TV show, I don't think, uh, hey kids, it's a XB clone of Ramsay Snow, this obvious retread of Ramsay as a character in The Long Night. That would drive people away. People don't want more of that. That isn't an attraction anymore. I'd like more Roose Bolton. They seem to have forgotten that after Season 3, but... The Dreadfort would be in it. And, of course, saving the best for last, Winterfell. Winterfell is the one location that would assuredly reappear in a Long Night prequel, and is considered the major selling point. But, as with the others, while it exists, it was just a humble ring fort during the entire Age of Heroes not even the Long Night, that, you know, they built it up incrementally over many centuries, and it's repeatedly said in the novels that different parts have different architecture because they added entire new wings and sections to it over time because it's so old, you can see it was built that way, gradually adding it and accreting more and more to it. So, you would see early Winterfell probably, you know, in an Age of Heroes show of them warring against the Red Kings of the Boltons to the east. As for the Long Night itself, however, it distinct from just, you know, the Age of Heroes, not before the Andals. We're talking 8,000 years ago in the Long Night. Remember, Bran the Builder, Brandon Stark, built Winterfell and the Wall and founded House Stark. Bran had to build Winterfell. He had to build the Wall. So... How much of Winterfell would be built already for most of this TV series? A smaller, humble wooden fort, you know, sort of like Edoras in Lord of the Rings, or just empty forest. I think you would have a village there because it's um, it's on natural hot springs, so it's actually a very obvious natural settlement point. That yes, any first men living in that region would try to build a town around there. It's a natural point where it's warm hot springs. But whatever it was, it was just your typical medieval Renaissance fair, you know, cheap TV movie town. I keep thinking of the way Mole's Town looks in the TV show, which is supposed to be cheap. That it's some or or the inn at the crossroads, random tiny medieval town made of wood. This isn't this megastructure castle Winterfell that we're all excited about. So familiar locations from the Winterfell set, like the battlements, or the Great Hall, or the Courtyard, they don't exist. Whatever is there. And Elio and Linda in Westeros.org's video on this, you know, point that out. That's one of the things they can say. They talk about it at some length, please check out their video, that there would be people living in the region of Winterfell, but it would be like a ring fort in the manner of the ancient Celts. And, you know, Stonehenge is a religious structure, but it, it was a small ring fort thing, it, or wood at best. It wasn't stone. Which, of course, brings me to, you know, Bran the Builder, the Wall. The Wall physically did not exist when the Long Night began. You know, Winterfell, you can at least say, well, maybe the castle didn't exist, but people would settle around natural hot springs. There should have been at least a village there. The wall has nothing. There is no precursor to it. There would be nothing related to the wall. Logically, it would only appear at the very, very end of this prequel series, after the White Walkers are defeated. 
mentally picture, think of this, think of how many scenes happened at Castle Black in the TV show. They would have none of that, of just if we take out Castle Black, King's Landing, Dragonstone, and to be honest, most of Winterfell, where is stuff happening other than yet another scene in the woods or in an army camp? So, in an easy-to-read set of lists, this is the black-and-white assessment of it. Objectively, what do they have to play around with? These locations physically didn't exist during the Long Night. King's Landing, Dragonstone, River Run, The Twins, Harrenhal, The Inn at the Crossroads, The Eyrie, Anything in Dorne, The King's Road and Other Highways, and The Wall and All Its Castles. I'm splitting this up into three categories. These ones technically existed, but key point, rarely or never appeared on screen in the TV series, defeating the entire point of hooking back the huge TV first audiences. Casterly Rock, High Garden, Horn Hill, Storm's End, which was officially never on screen, and The Bloody Gate. Lastly, the few major recurring locations in the Game of Thrones TV series, which did exist in at least some form during the Long Night. Winterfell, the Dreadfort, Moat Caelan. And then outside of the North, and we're not even sure if they'll do stuff outside of the North, Pike and Old Town. I don't really know how much of a draw those other ones are beyond Winterfell. Maybe Pike, but would the story go out of the north? I don't know. The big locations people are interested in, Winterfell and Pike, and I don't know if people, or if it's limited to the north, the Dreadford and Moat Caelan aren't anything. So it's really just Winterfell, and even then that is grasping at straws, because it's not the full Winterfell yet. Talk about this list in the comments. Good? So, summation. Two categories of people. Book fans and TV show fans. Neither group would be hooked by places from the books that don't appear in the TV show. The book fans don't trust HBO anymore. That after everything they did with Dorne and with Sansa and Stannis, it, they're going to go, oh, wow, you'll see Storm's End in this prequel. I, I don't feel compelled to watch after that. You already lost us. And the new viewers, everyone that doesn't know stuff in the books, if you don't know what it is, it doesn't mean anything to new viewers. They don't know what Storm's End is. So if the Long Night's goal is hook back the huge TV first Game of Thrones audience with familiar places from the original TV series, few of those locations even existed in that time period. For that matter, locations in the TV show were also more concentrated due to necessary story condensation. Thus, King's Landing not appearing is a bigger blow to TV-only viewers than to book fans. So, like, if you had an, an Andal Invasion era prequel, book readers might actually be interested in, well, okay, we wouldn't see King's Landing, but I'm interested in seeing Old Town and the High Septons and the Maesters. TV-only fans were barely introduced to Old Town. They were not invested, and they wouldn't care. 